You're watching a Facts with Fiona media production. I'm Fiona Moriarty, and this is the Fiona Moriarty Show. Hi, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the 16th episode of the Fiona Moriarty Show Season 2. This week, we sat down with Leon Frierson, former child star of Nickelodeon's All That, to discuss his time at the network and his recent documentary, Quiet on Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV. Frierson gives us a behind-the-scenes look at his time on set, his experience working under Dan Schneider, the evolution of his friendship with Amanda Bynes, and shares both the dark and bright sides of his time on one of the most popular kid shows of the 90s. Let's go to our conversation with Frierson. Hi, Leon. Welcome to the show. This is Leon Frierson from All That. You are also a rapper, but we're here today to talk about your recent documentary, Quiet on Set. So I wanted to ask you, number one, how did you get into acting and how did you land the role on all that on Nickelodeon? Wow. You know, when I was young, when I was young, I think my parents just saw a certain spark in me. You know, they, they were coming from Indiana and kind of living in Los Angeles and in California was always like a big dream. And then even further than that was getting on television and, you know, using your talent to, to get on, you know, to actually be in front of the world and or on the silver screen was always a dream or it seemed like a big, you know, a big picture that for them that they wanted to fulfill for me. And so I got into acting uh, in a lot of ways, um, the same way a lot of people did as far as they heard like a commercial on the radio and was like, hey, if your kid is talented, come on down. Yeah. And that's when I did. I actually joined a, um, a talent a agency or like a showcase right uh where they had some agents come down i performed for them they uh, they liked what they saw and then i, I went and i was represented after that and so with that you know all that was um probably my second or third year into the audition process and once it came across my desk i was like extremely excited you know i was a big fan of keenan and kel I'm going into the audition i did an impression of Mike Tyson, did an impression of Jim Carrey and also like some old lady character I thought of. And they were impressed. I mean, obviously they must have been right. I got on the show yeah. and liked what they saw. You know, I just remember it being one of the most important auditions up, up until that point for me. I really, obviously when you see all that in Nickelodeon, as a kid, that is something that you're drawn to versus like, you know, a little small exactly. role movie or something. So I took it super seriously and here we are today. <laughs> I mean, Nickelodeon was a 90s kid's dream. Pretty much everybody wanted to be on Nickelodeon. Everybody was watching Nickelodeon. It was on everybody's cable TVs. So you joined the show the third season, correct, in 1997? Uh, it was, that was a fourth season, yeah. Fourth season in 1997. So what was the climate on set of all that? I mean, obviously, the documentary explores the dark side of Nickelodeon. But starting out on onset, what were your first impressions on all that? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, we did want to bring some injustices to, to life with the documentary and also just shed a light on, you know, what, what has taken place with child stars. And that was my main motivation for tapping in. But when we were actually on set, you know, like, I didn't understand these jokes were like sexual jokes or anything like that. That wasn't what was going through my head. I was just, one, happy to get around these stars that I looked up to, like Keenan and Kel. Um, got to know Amanda she was like one of my best friends and so it was like instantly a whole great family environment and then when you layer on you know the musical guests I was a huge fan of music you mentioned I've done some music in my past that was something that I was absolutely in love with so every single Friday was like you're meeting one of your favorite artists and so it was always an, an amazing I would say it was a good experience for the most part on set it's just you know sometimes when you look back at it with an adult lens then you're kind of like huh you know you kind of question some things but while actually on set things are pretty good so talking about those specific you talk about two specific I guess sketches in all that in the documentary um there's you were forced to wear leotards in one of them and then the other one was the nose boy could you elaborate on how those sketches you know, made you feel as a kid and obviously yeah. looking back at them now. 
Yeah, so I mean, it was it was a common theme. You know, there was a lot of superheroes, right? <laughs> there was always some silly like because I played Pillow Boy, I played Captain Big Nose. I I I named him Nose Boy, I think, in the documentary, but I believe the the official name was Captain Big Nose. Um, also did like Vote Boy for Kids Choice Awards. And then when you look at, you know, Keenan was super dude. And um, I believe Josh Server, he once played like an aerobics guy. He had to wear like some tights and leotards and stuff. It was a common theme for guys to be in leotards and sometimes dresses as well. Um, you know, those things are pretty uncomfortable. I would I will say it's just, I think, kind of natural. It's not something that you would put on on a daily basis. And yeah, like I was just a, you know, a, um, a boy's boy, a kid's kid. I don't know. And like those things, you know, did actually meet me with some discomfort. Um, but at the same time, you just look at it as, hey, this is what we've seen. The Even the biggest stars on the show do. It's just something you kind of have to accept with the territory. Um, and then and the way I mentioned it, like it's not something that I really, especially specifically with Captain Big Nose, um, and how the sexual innuendo in the scene, right, that they that is portrayed in the documentary, not something I'm thinking about at the time. Um, and to be quite frank, it wasn't something that I actually noticed until I was looking at footage and pictures going into the doc. You know, my manager was like, hey, that kind of looks like a phallic symbol. Like, it kind of looks a little yeah. strange. And so I was looking at it, and it is something that caught the eye of the producers, and they wanted to, you know, hone in on that. But it's not something that I came into the documentary like, oh, we have to talk about Captain Big Nose, or we, yeah. you know, I was more concerned with, you know, how I felt having to wear leotards tights like underwear type stuff I know I would always ask for hey can we throw some shorts on or I was feeling a little like um you know self-conscious about my body like do we have to yeah you gotta wear the tights but um yeah. I think it's pretty natural sometimes it could be funny could just be written in the joke but at the same time it depends on how you look at it if you're looking in the adult lens could be a little bit sinister uh, specifically Captain Big Nose I don't think wearing leotards is necessarily sinister yeah. but the fairies, captain but... big nose in the documentary they talk about like it almost looking kind of like male genitalia which is a little bit right. suggestive and from the adult perspective i mean obviously the parents on these shows kids don't even know that's the thing that's the right. really sick part about a lot of these sexual in innuendos when you were a kid you weren't thinking about those things because obviously you're how old were you on all that yeah, so I did all that from 10 to 12. And so cer certainly at 10 and 11, definitely not. And then, you know, I wasn't going to like middle school regularly at 12. I was uh, going and I was in and out of set. And so maybe some of those jokes I would have got to be introduced to if I was in school and around kids that were joking around that way. I'm not sure, actually. Not sure. Wow. But, um, you know, definitely was not top of mind or something that I would have been complaining about specifically at that time. No. What was it like working for Dan Schneider? Yeah, so with Dan, you know, he was there during my fourth season and I auditioned for him. He actually helped get me on the show. And, um, you know, there there must have been, um, you know, I was a little bit too young to be privy to it at the time. But in my fifth and sixth seasons, he wasn't there. And I believe it was, um, there were some issues with the other staff members um, specifically on the executive staff where they had parted ways, you know, I just remember wanting to impress Dan and, and knowing that, you know, he was the creator of the lot of the, um, of the sketches, the characters, and that if you showed him that you had a specific talent or you had something to offer to the show, that it could possibly get you some more airtime and, and written in some more sketches. So it was always, you know, th that dynamic where, you know, he's kind of holding the keys. You want to get the keys <laughs> uh, and you want to unlock those doors. So he's always someone you always wanted to perform well in front of. And if you didn't, he he may have had a way of showing like, eh, it was our, you know, maybe he didn't give you that extra pat on the back. <laughs> you know, it's like, OK, I, I could have done a little bit better. Um, but, you know, I, I will say he he definitely was drawn to some of the more talented 
Well, I wouldn't say, yeah, at the time they were, they were just more talented. They were more popular and you could really see him fostering those relationships more than the supportive cast members. Other black actors and all that, like Brian Hearn described a culture of racism on the set and how he was forced to do like a scene selling cookies like a drug dealer. Did you feel any of these, you know, racist um, kind of undertones or he, he also said like Dan had favorites. So since he was not one of the favorites, he was written off the show. Yeah, so, and I have been asked about this even in the documentary. Um, I personally, I wouldn't attribute anything or any feelings that I had to race, you know, um, and specifically just because when you look at Keenan and Kel, also yeah. Nick Cannon, all yeah. Black males on my cast, it's kind of hard to say that, you know, that race had anything to do with me either, um, you know, being su uh, succeeding or not. Um, and, and I do believe Nickelodeon was actually at the forefront of giving African Americans, Black actors, uh, people of all race a chance, and also having these great hodgepodge of uh, multicultural uh, casts, you know, yeah. um, I do believe they did a good job at that. Now, during my time, though, Dan Schneider wasn't, he wasn't like the, he didn't, wasn't the showrunner and the controlling executive producer. Uh, during Brian and G Giovanni's terms, uh, when the Zoe 101s and the Victorious and all those came out, Dan came back with a lot more power on his shows. Now, obviously, he's coming back into the network. I'm sure they offered him something in return, which is just maybe full autonomy on what, what he wanted to go on in his sets. But during my time, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't complain of racism or anything like that. And I believe I had some great people to look up to uh, of my skin tone that were great examples and uh, actually paved the way for me to be there in the first place. So uh, not not necessarily my experience, but it doesn't discount others. Thank you for that. So how did the they had this thing called on air dares? And I remember seeing this as a kid. I mean, there were like some like some of the kids like were forced to eat scorpions and then some of them were put in peanut butter and dogs were licking them others like slime and all this stuff were there any on-air dares that made you feel like especially uncomfortable where you just didn't want to participate well I was lucky they didn't have on-air dares during my time this is <laughs> okay this is Dan coming back like I said he was okay. yeah you got okay. to you know he got to run wild with that but I will comment and just say that it, it's, it sucks because they put you in a, a, a difficult situation um, because these are professional actors. You wouldn't be, have to expect to do these fear factor type challenges or these literally like scared that like this is this is scary stuff. <laughs> Don't put me nothing. No scorpions anywhere near me right. or worms um, or dogs. Look at me, please uh, just keep that away. So I think it is very difficult for a professional actor be, to be put in that position. But at the same time, it's kind of hard to say no to, um, you know, what is expected to you as, as a cast member. So you had mentioned Amanda previously. Could you walk me through your evolution of friendship with Amanda Bynes? Absolutely. So yeah, when we first met, we were, we're about three months apart and most of the cast members, like I think the second close would have been uh, Danny Tamborelli, he's maybe a five or six years older than us. Later on, we got Mark Saul, who is about in our age range as well. But really for a season, season and a half, Amanda, me and Amanda were like the only true kids. When you're 16, 17 and in the industry, you're almost basically like an adult or at least have that adult mindset. Um, but the two of us, you know, we were thick as thieves running around, had to be in school and also spent time during the summer times at each other's houses. And she attended my play once. We wore matching outfits. It was great. You know, as I will say, there was a little shift in how, you know, how we interacted on the show. Once Mark Saul was there, he was another guy my age I think I you know played with him a little bit more and then she also you know got her own show the Amanda show she was very busy on the you know during the off season and things like kind of dwindled a bit and then I would say just after the show unfortunately you know we just haven't had any contact literally in probably about 20 years and so I have reached out to her especially uh, especially when I seen things happening to her in the news 
um, you know, and uh, just to make sure that that was there as as a support if necessary, if if I could be. And then uh, all the way up until now, you know, I even when I've seen her, you know, because she's been in the news for, I would say, almost five, 10 years now uh, with uh, some of the transgressions that she's gone through. The latest was when I, I showed up to her conservatorship hearing, hoping to touch base with her, hoping to reignite with her, just let her know that she does have a support system that only care about her. I don't really care to, you know, to to use her for cloud or anything. It's just really... Wow. It's really just about letting her know that she has a friend from way back, <laughs> an old friend that just remembers the 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 kid, the the crazy kid that she is, and and that we were together, and that um you know if she ever needed someone to talk to or just someone to relate to, there we do relate on I think a lot of different levels. So I would be there for her. But yeah, it's been that long. So if you if you could tell her, hey, my email, you know my email. Um, yes. you know, I do know one or two people that is in contact with her but I always just felt that I didn't want to ever intrude on her I would give her the opportunity or the invitation to you know reach out to me but it's up it's all up to her you know I know she's going through a lot yeah I mean Amanda definitely had been plucked out from the all that set you mentioned in the documentary you guys went to school on set, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. Would she be with you in, in school or did she kind of like go off sometimes with Dan for specific extra scenes? Right, because yeah, it, in the documentary, they did pluck out a statement from me where I'm like, she was never in school. I never got <laughs> to see her, right? And I was like, oh, did I say that? I did ask, you know, and I do remember having that feeling that, you know, I was always, because we had to do a certain amount of hours per day. Yeah. It was maybe four, four to five hours per day. And it just, sometimes it just seemed like, you know, I was in there alone or where is Amanda, you know? And like, is she, I never knew if she was with Dan or not, or, or if, if she was participating in writing sessions or pitching characters, I, I could never say for sure. Cause obviously I was in school, so I wasn't witnessing it with my own eyes, but I could only imagine that she was, you know, advancing you know, that she was advancing her career by working by, you know, she was very, very creative minded by pitching ideas and talking out characters. And, you know, she was in a lot of sets or a lot of uh, sketches. So it could have been anything from like, uh, they needed some extra wardrobe time or they wanted to uh, get her opinion on these rewrites or edits. It could have been literally anything, but I do know she had a heightened relationship with the writers uh, and specifically Dan Schneider. I don't think that's any secret. A lot of people do attest to that. So obviously the Jason Handy sexual misconduct and that came out. I mean, obviously he's a registered sex offender and he was sending, you know, pornographic images to girls on set and he made some comments. He's a self-pronounced pedophile. He was arrested and served time. What was your impression of Jason Handy? I mean, obviously he was just a set hand. He was a PA on set. But what did what did you think about him when you were on set as a kid? And were you surprised when the allegations came out? So yeah, once again, Jason was not, he wasn't during my time either. Oh, he wasn't. Okay. Or he might, you know, he, he might've been, I don't think so. Yeah, but he wasn't there during my time. So season seven through 10, he, that's when he would have been around the, all that sets when Brian so me and Brian and Giovanni we like never really cross like our seasons are totally separate so Brian Peck wasn't involved in your season either Brian Peck is not involved in my seasons either okay. so yeah hearing about it a lot of this stuff I did hear you know with the doc um you know I had some idea specifically of Brian Peck for sure I think his is a little bit more publicized and, um, you know, I am friendly with Brian and Giovanni, so I kind of got the heads up on that. But like, yeah, Pickle Boy was not on our set. And, you know, I think a, I don't want to say it's because, oh, Dan Schneider wasn't there and he was, you know, creating the culture that allowed them to do it. But mm -hmm. I do think that they were running a little bit more of a tight ship during my season, seasons of four through six, where we really saw, where we saw sorry, Brian Robbins and Mike Tolan, they were really were taking the leadership there. 
And there was also another producer that stepped in when, when Dan was not around. So, and that name for, escapes me right now. But in general, you know, I think that they, they tried to weed out uh, some of those behaviors that Dan may have shown a glimpse of. I don't want to say anything about like this, the sexual assault or anything, because really there, there was no evidence of that during my time that I can remember. And I was just so young. Now, if you talk to certain cast members, you get, <laughs> they, they will say that there were their inklings of that during the time. It's just nothing that I could specifically attest to. And which is why they didn't use any of my testimony testimony towards that in the doc either so it seemed that like it heightened like it got maybe during your time it was a little bit more innocent and a little bit more like Dan was trying to just prove himself and mm. then it seems as though there were a little bit more opportunities to you know add these these people that were not necessarily the best ethical people in the world to the crew during your season there were some disputes with Keenan and Kel. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, so I know there were there were times where they weren't weren't on set. Whether it was, you know, I believe they were just having contract disputes and you know wanting to get properly compensated for the value that they brought to the show. Obviously, you know, they had their own show, Keenan and Kel, at the same time, so they they brought a whole lot of value to the network. And so one, I, th I think there was issues with uh, them and management and the executive team on, you know, finding a monetary number for that, for their value, which led them to being away from the set at times. But ultimately they, they always came back. They always figured it out. You know, I wasn't privy to I the exact conversations and what caused their time off. There's a reason why Josh Server is the longest tenured cast member because he was always there. He never left. <laughs> Keenan and Kel for, for a certain stance did leave. And then, you know, we kind of all speculate on if they had their own, that's why they may have broke apart, why we didn't see them together for a number of years. They talk about it and, it, you know, it just seems like, hey, they just grew apart and just wanted their own separate identities and didn't want to always be tied to each other. But you know, ultimately with Good Burger 2 out, shout outs to them and them able to come back together and get that done. They're really showing that they are, you know, they are truly brothers. But I think just like with any family, you can only do so much and spend so much time with people. You know, it's good to see them back together again, though. So enter Nick Cannon and the cast was a little bit displaced from the show. How did that happen? I mean, did Dan kind of find him and then say, like, let's write off all the other the characters or how did that really work? So Nick Cannon was actually, he was a hype man for the audience in oh, season okay. four. Yeah, so he was a hype man for the audience in season four and he got brought into the cast though. I and mean, this is like unprecedented. Wow. Like no one ever gets to do, have that type of opportunity yeah. where you're literally hyping up the crowd for the live shows. He, he might've been- really he got really lucky because you were part of the main cast and you were casted in from auditions. This right. Nick, Nick Cannon just was this hype guy. And then did Dan notice him or what really, what made that happen? I, I don't know. I, I don't know what made it happen. I, you know, I do know that he had some great management back then. He was, I think, associated with like Will Smith and he had a great relationship in the comedy scene he was actually doing very professional comedy gigs at 16 and 17 year old so maybe it was hey the the management maybe they talked them into it maybe they asked them for an audition i couldn't tell you for sure but i do know <laughs> that you know it was whenever someone joins the cast it is the shoveling for the cast members because it directly affects your airtime, how many sketches you're written into, you know, your your stardom, and then also your reaction to the fans. He was a, a huge bomb that just got ignited into our cast. Now, me, I, I didn't have any issue with it. I don't, I don't think I was so invested that, you know, I, I needed more airtime. I wasn't really invested in that way. I was kind of just happy to be around, I will say. But to me, I looked at it as almost a, an insurance policy 
for Akini and Arkell in case they were to move uh, move forward or um, not come back, that they had someone that could fill in those adult male roles like uh, Nick Cannon, who was hilarious and a great talent. So I really seen it as an insurance policy for Kel, if anything. <laughs> so Nickelodeon made a statement about, you know, the toxic work culture and environment at Nickelodeon and how you know, they weren't aware about a lot of things. What would be your comment on on that and them kind of feigning this ignorance per se and just kind of blaming one specific, if you read the statement, it's very long. You probably read it. Mm-hmm. One specific person. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of, you know, it's a little bit of a scapegoat, a little bit irresponsible and hard to believe, right? That They had no idea when people on set had a lot of ideas. And, you know, I mentioned in in seasons one through three, before I got there, I've, I've had the privilege of talking to a lot of those cast members, especially in the podcast realm on the Prime Nostalgia podcast. I've interviewed them and talked to them about like the things that they have seen and or even And I've also had a private conversation, some things they don't want to talk about. (laughs) And as you can tell from the participation, really only Katrina Johnson was there from the the original cast. But I will say there's been hints of this stuff going on for a long time. And then even if you look at other shows, like say a, a Ren and Stimpy, you know, there's been some issues with the creator there and some of these other shows that have some questionable content. I, I find it hard to believe that they had no idea. Now, I do think that the culture of the 90s was different, though, where some of these things were a little bit more permissible, where people weren't really being whistleblowers and coming out to tell, and you kind of just accepted it as part of the industry. So I think that, to me, would have been a better excuse than, oh, we just didn't know, or yeah. it was just this one guy, and he was kind of running the show. I think there was definitely something better that they could have done for the cast members of all that and other Dan Schneider shows. Because when you listen to uh, the experience of, uh, you know, other actors from like Taina or Nets the Classified recently, they both said that, hey, that was nothing like our experience. We had no idea that this would have been going on. And it's just kind of unfathomable that this would happen because, I, you know, I've been on figured out. I've been on a part of the Kids' Choice Awards and other Nickelodeon uh, productions and really just uh, just a, a different feeling overall. So, you know, while I do think there is some blame on the culture that was created locally, I, it's hard to believe that Nickelodeon was totally oblivious just based on the complaints I know about and that um, there isn't something better they could have done for us. So I know Nickelodeon issued that blank statement, but have they reached out specifically to you? No, no. And I don't, I really don't expect them to. (laughs) I don't expect them to. I haven't heard from them about anything in years. So, you know, I'm just little old Leon, you know what I'm saying? Just telling my story. If they were to reach out to me though, and had a genuine apology or, you know, a pledge to do better in the future, I'm not one to hold grudges or, you know, judge someone forever. I do believe that they have some redeeming qualities at Nickelodeon that can, uh, that they can turn things around and do better for the future of child actors and performers and, and also staff members on set. I do believe that there is something they can do to make sure that they are doing better. And they may already be doing that. When you look at the, the Lele's, um, you know, that that girl Lele and also uh, like Dylan, there's so many new talents that are, that are a part of these shows now. And even all that, the, the new version of all that I have been on the set I will say it was very professional and that they um, you know were always looking out for the talent there and so I would give them a pat on the back for trying to make that change but um, you know if, if you guys wanted to consult with me about how I felt and the things that I would change about the industry I'm totally open to it and there are some things that I, I would love to see put in place for child actors to protect them in the future. Yeah, exactly. It is kind of a shame that they didn't reach out to anyone specifically from the documentary. I mean, I know Alexa Nicholas has a specific organization. It's called Eat Predators. And Mm -hmm. the fact that they, Nickelodeon, isn't finding any remorse in their heart to even reach out to the the kids that were victims on the set of their productions is really kind of concerning. But 
I know you, are, so are you involved with Alexa's organization or, or any of, of her work? You know, so I support her wholeheartedly. And then also like an Allison Stoner, she, she does have some efforts out there to change laws for child actors, you know, so I, I support them both, you know, in the public and behind closed doors. I would say me personally, I, I'm just never a person that is going to boycott just because I would find myself boycotting Disney, Nike, Apple, everything, every, yeah. every single company has some type of, you know, I, I would say dark side, right? Just to put it in the terms of the documentary. I do support them in their efforts wholeheartedly and 100%. And you know, whatever they need me to do, I can't promise I'll do it, but I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try, I'll get in where I fit in. You know what I mean? And, and for me though, I'm just always focusing on the next generation, giving them the information because I don't think that children are going to not want to be entertainers or not want to be in the industry, especially with the emergence of social media. I believe that that is, that's the new version of what we what were doing in the nineties. But of course, there's no big corporate entity over social media. So it's a little bit different, but you know, you're going to see them go through these same phases where they were on top of the world and it could literally be snatched from them overnight if you know but really you know to be realistically over a couple of years things will phase out for you everyone has their kind of window where they can take advantage of their talent you know I, I I do want to be part of a bigger mission where we can just see laws put in place so anyone that has that type of mission I'm going to be behind them and uh, make sure that I lend my experience and also my testimony to their cause exactly and then my final question for you is if you do you have kids right now? I have two kids, yeah. So if you obviously if your kids were ever on a Nickelodeon set in the future, what systems or you know support would you want to see and new programs installed on set to prevent this from happening ever again? Yeah, so I think it's important to to have um to have counseling. And by that, you want to make sure that the that the that the child understands that, hey, this could be temporary. Uh -huh. And to always be reaffirming that this is what they want to do. Because there may be days where you're feeling like, I don't want to do this. And no, you can't just quit in the middle of a season or in the middle of a contract. We understand that. But you can constantly uh, be checking up and have check-ins. So that way, when you do get to a, a certain point in your career or in your contract, maybe you can bow out or take, a, take um, some time to yourself after you're able to you know, properly reflect and understand what's going on. Because it's, it's very difficult for you to make a decision about how you're going to be perceived in the world. <laughs> at 10 and 12 so yeah you understand that hey around you everyone loves you because you're on a tv show and you're able to make some money and help out your family maybe or just live out your dreams of performing but I don't think it's hard for you to really grasp on how the world is going to perceive you and then moving forward also I think you know productions if they are to hire hire child actors they should understand that there's a risk that once they turn 18 or once they get older in life, that maybe they don't want to be a part of the industry. Maybe they found out that they made a mistake or that it wasn't what they thought it was going to be. And so there should be there should be an opportunity for them to opt out of them still being broadcast or to renegotiate. Say, so say if I, you know, did it for say it was a two thousand dollar contract and I, you know now it's everywhere around the world you we should be able to we should you should have to talk to me about that again because you in a, a lot of ways you ex exploited my naivete or you exploited the fact that you no know, my mom just wanted or my parents or my management just wanted me on tv and so why would they say no why would they say no for this amount of money or for this amount of exposure but now that I'm old and I'm able to really assess that. You should come to me. We should have to come to an agreement for you to continue to broadcast my likeness. And so I, I think there should be some, there should be some more risks for networks to sign on children, understanding that, hey, they may not agree to this for the rest of their lives. And there should be something. I, completely, 
I completely agree. And that's why I was saying earlier, I was like, Nickelodeon should have reached out and, and consulted with you and asked you if this is okay to continue airing. And obviously they didn't. So thank you so much, Leon, for coming on. I really appreciate hearing your story and hearing about, you know, the dark side of Nickelodeon, but also some of the, the great moments you had on set with Amanda and your other castmates. Yeah, so, yeah, and, and just to wrap things up, I do want to reiterate that it wasn't all bad, you know. There were some good times. Some of the things we look back at with an adult lens and you either they are questionable, but uh, if you were, you know, to get your kids into child acting or if you're a child, a child entertainer watching this, uh, just make sure that it's something that you want to do, you know, and there's nothing wrong with just getting the training, getting training, 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 and then once you're old enough to really make those decisions and understand what you're getting yourself into, then hop into the game. You don't, don't rush it. You don't yeah. got to do it at a 10 year old, uh, at the <laughs> age 10, the way I did. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of The Fiona Moriarty Show. Before you go, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and iHeartRadio. And for more behind-the-scenes footage of the show, visit us at factswithfiona.com and follow me at Fiona Moriarty on Instagram and factswithfiona on Twitter. See you next week.